Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. It's day two of the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act. We hear from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who was asked if he would resign if the Commission finds that invoking the Act was not justified. New inflation numbers from Stats Canada show us just how much food prices have increased. And we hear from Travel Alberta, which says they have a plan to bring $1.3 billion worth of tourism business to southern Alberta over the next 13 years. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The public inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act during the Freedom Convoy continued today. The Commission's mandate is to examine the circumstances that led Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to invoke the Act on February 14th and to investigate the measures the Canadian government took under the Act. The Ottawa Police Chief allegedly said it should never have been invoked and the Ontario Provincial Police say the Act was not needed. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked if he would resign if the inquiry reveals that there was no justification for evoking the Act last February. I think the important thing is for Canadians to understand uh, the, the situation we were in and the choices we make. We didn't enter uh, into using the Emergencies Act lightly. We used it uh, with a sense of uh, it was the necessary tool at the time. Uh, we used it in a way that was measured and proportionate. Uh, and we're really pleased that the Commission is going to be able to hear from all these witnesses. And that was why I offered to appear. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association raised concerns about the inquiry, which is taking place in Ottawa. Now, one of their lawyers, Kara Zwiebel, says the Trudeau Liberals should have gone before Parliament to pass legislation during the Freedom Convoy instead of using an emergency measure. It seems like the, the resources that were requested by the Ottawa Police Service in particular um, sort of finally came through right around the same time as, um, as the Act was invoked. So I think there's a question there about whether... Um, you know, which which had more impact. Um, but but if you think about, you know, um, situations where the government is in a very um, difficult situation, like um, like a, a labor strike, for example, of, of um, you know, essential workers, um, there have been instances where the government has gone to Parliament and passed legislation very quickly to get those people back to work. Um, now, that's not something we would want to see happen on a regular basis. Um, but but I think there is a, a question here about why, um, if, if we did need new laws, um, why couldn't we pass those laws rather than use uh, an emergency measure which places all of the control in the hands of the executive and, and takes it out of the control of Parliament? That, that's one of the questions I think we think needs to be answered. Alberta is one of the two provinces that has full standing to participate in all aspects of the hearings taking place in Ottawa. It will argue it had the tools necessary to deal with the various blockades. Now, in a statement, Alberta Justice Minister Tyler Shandro said Alberta will demonstrate that the Coots border blockade was effectively dealt with prior to the federal government's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. The decision to invoke the act violated the constitutionally guaranteed rights of Albertans and gave the federal government the ability to seize property without due process of law. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith says she wants to follow through on her campaign promise to enshrine protections in the Alberta Human Rights Act for people based on vaccination status. Doing so would put whether or not one chose to receive a COVID-19 vaccine jab on par with gender, sexual orientation, race and religious beliefs in our province's landmark anti-discrimination law. Critics say the act would effectively protect a newly created freedom of one group of citizens and in doing so would limit protections against disease for other Albertans. In other words, healthcare workers would be free to be unprotected against an array of other diseases as they work in hospitals. The commander of the Canadian Armed Forces says he's easing the military's COVID-19 vaccine mandate. But General Wayne Eyre says the military will maintain the requirement for many service members, depending on their roles and responsibilities. We have to remember it's in the context of a, an evolving pandemic situation, one that's not over yet. And so as the pandemic evolves, our, our approach to vaccination needs to evolve as well. So we're moving from uh, vaccination mandatory for everybody to an operationally oriented um, vaccination policy where we focus on the operational output, those elements that are uh, deploying into uh, regions that require uh, the vaccination or those that are on, uh, on high readiness. 
And we've got to remember that we are the, the force of last resort. So when everything else fails, um, the Canada turns to us and we have to be able to produce that readiness. Canada's ambassador to the United States says the Nexus Trusted Traveler program is being held hostage by the Biden administration. Canadian government officials say the U.S. is trying to renegotiate the 20-year-old pre-clearance agreement. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says talks are ongoing. We are engaging almost every day uh, with our American counterparts to ensure uh, the smooth flow of goods and services and people across our border. We have the longest shared uh, border in the world uh, that is extraordinarily important for both of our economies. And we're going to continue to work with them on ways to make it smoother and more effective for people to work on both sides of the border. That's why the Trusted tra Traveler program like Nexus is so important and why uh, we're so eager uh, to get it rolling again. Well, it was another beautiful autumn day here in Lethbridge. So many of the leaves changing color, especially down by the Old Man River. Jeanette Rocher is in now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, those mild fall temperatures should continue into this weekend. Yeah, they should, Hal, and it should be perfect conditions to get down into the river bottom and enjoy the nice weather and those gorgeous leaves that we've been having. But we are looking at a little bit of a windy overnight with winds from the north gusting to 40 kilometers per hour, an overnight low of 4 degrees. Into Saturday, though, lots of clear skies, sunshine, high of 16 degrees. After that, we're going to get even warmer up into the mid-20s. I'll be back later in the show to let you know how the rest of the weekend is shaping up. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Travel Alberta is working with various partner agencies to bring $1.3 billion worth of tourism to Lethbridge and Medicine Hat over the next 13 years. Now to discuss this in more detail is the Manager of Destination Development for Travel Alberta, Andy Zillums, who joins us now from Calgary. Andy, $1.3 billion? That's pretty ambitious. How are you going to make that happen? We engage our residents, we engage the businesses, and we're engaging, um, you know, our tourism organizations, our destination marketing organizations within um, within the province to really formulate uh, a strategic tourism plan moving forward for 10 different tourism development zones in the province. And with this, we're super excited that um, coming out of this will be five to 10 um, potential um, investment opportunities that are really going to help us drive um, those tourism revenues into, into these destinations. Now let's talk about more specifics. Are you going to also tap into the U.S. or European markets, getting more visitors to see, let's say, the Nikuyuko Japanese Garden, our coolies in Lethbridge? How about the legendary TP in Medicine Hat or visiting Waterton Lakes National Park? So we do have, um, you know, international strategic kind of markets that we're currently um, engaging with, um, the U.S. being our primary market and into the U.K., um, but we definitely are, are looking at, um, you know, the opportunity of how, what that looks like from, from an international perspective and who those target markets are and really being able to um, deliver an experience that they're looking for. Um, but, you know, as you said, going into Waterton, Lethbridge is, is a great hub and, you you know, we we see that opportunity being, you know, on the doorstep of many um, national parks, but also the doorstep of, um, you know, some of our, our really unique and cultural sites as well in the province. So, you know, super excited that um, we'll be able to, you know, utilize Lethbridge and, and all that it currently has and maybe even just try to grow um, some of the experiences that we have in the region. Okay, thanks so much, Andy. That was Andy Zillums, Manager of Destination Development for Travel Alberta, joining us from Calgary. With inflation and rising food prices, more and more Canadians are finding it extremely difficult to make ends meet. According to Stats Canada, the cost of food climbed 10.8% compared to a year ago. Now here's a look at some of the items which have gone up the most. Edible fats and oils skyrocketed close to 30%. Condiments and spices were up around 18%. Fresh fruit? jumped 13.2%. Sugar and confectionery went up 11.3%. Fish and seafood, meanwhile, increased 8.7%. Dairy products climbed 7%, and meat gained 6.5%. Personal finance experts say Canadians should consider switching to a value market to save money. They say these discount supermarkets carry the same products as brand-name grocery stores, but are less expensive. Ben Campbell is a young rancher in Black Diamond, Alberta. 
He was the recipient of an award recently from the Alberta Northwest Territories region of Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers Program. Ben takes issue with politicians who say that we need to curtail the methane produced by cattle. According to Ben, the gas produced by cows is just part of the natural cycle. Cattle can be great for the environment if they're managed properly, and cattle can be bad for the environment if they're managed poorly. Um, methane that comes out of them is part of the natural carbon cycle. Methane is a carbon molecule. And so before there were cattle, there were bison, there's elk and uh, deer and all these different ruminants. And ruminants are a necessary keystone species on grasslands. So methane that's cycled is also absorbed. It has like a roughly a 10-year lifespan in the atmosphere. And so we have sort of a biological allowance for that. So I'm, I'm fine with that. It's, it fits in with a natural cycle. Alberta rancher Ben Campbell will also discuss how cattle are nutrient recyclers and how inflation is impacting his cattle operation. Watch for that informative interview coming up after Business News. Now here's a follow-up to a story we brought you earlier this week. Mocha Cabana and its sister company, Mocha Local, shocked many in our community with their decision to close their doors here in Lethbridge. Video journalist Micah Quinn chatted with local business owners and members of the local economic organizations on how this loss will really impact our community. The loss of those two establishments is really very devastating, not only to downtown, but the whole of Lethbridge. A sign on the door of Mocha Cabana says it all. It reads in part that the business faced insurmountable odds during the past few years of the pandemic, and the current economic state proved too much, forcing them to close their doors. Mocha Cabana's sister company, Mocha Local, will also be shutting down. Sarah Amies, the community director with the Lethbridge Downtown BRZ, says issues like inflation and the pandemic have made it hard for businesses in Lethbridge to survive. I understand that a lot of businesses are sort of living on that razor edge, um, dependent on a good sale day or not. Vicki Vandenhoek, the owner of Honkers Pub and Eatery on the north side of Lethbridge, says it's heartbreaking to see situations like this one. Everybody thinks COVID is over. It's not. I mean, there's a lingering effect. And we went through two years of hell, you know, trying to keep a, keep going. And it's just if you can keep hanging on, keep hanging on. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for them, it wasn't able to, to do that. According to the CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge, Trevor Lewington, numbers from the latest census indicate that overall, business counts in the Lethbridge Census metropolitan area are actually up this year compared to 2021, and even when compared with 2019 numbers. So in 2019, in our Lethbridge Census metropolitan area, there were 4,447 businesses that were quote-unquote active, so that's before that pandemic. We saw that number drop a little bit in 2021 to 4,440. And then most recently, so far this year, we're sitting at 4,791. So there are more businesses operating in the Lethbridge Census metropolitan area, but that doesn't necessarily mean those businesses are doing well or necessarily making a profit, right? So I think that's important to know. Bridge City News reached out to Mocha Cabana and its sister company, Mocha Local, for comment on the story, but we have yet to hear back. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Last month, Hurricane Ian ravaged the state of Florida, causing billions upon billions of dollars in damage. Now, here in Lethbridge, we also deal with very strong winds. That's why we have the nickname of the Windy City. Now, two former Lethbridge College students were inspired to research and create a much stronger and sturdier roof to prevent damage from devastating winds. The former students are now finalists for the ASET Capstone Project of the Year Award. The winners will be announced later this year. The staff and students explain how this technology really works. So essentially what we did is we constructed multiple samples of three different connection types, a traditional three nailed toe nailing, a hurricane tie connection and a structural threaded screw. We took all of these connection types, we loaded them into a universal testing machine at the Lethbridge College. That machine puts a tensile force on the sample, which eventually causes a failure, which is recorded and we were able to identify that failure point. Two be able to secure those roof trusses to the top plate the way they have uh, really increases the complete chances of survival in, in, a, in a high windstorm. But what's more, it makes it safer. I think it's, it's safer to be able to install the trusses. Now, this new technology has already been used out in the field and there are plans to continue with it in the future. The city is saying a big thank you to community members who participated in the Canada 150 Forest Project at Watermark Park through New Monument. From 2017 to 2021, locals purchased trees with all of the proceeds from the sale of each tree going towards the city's recreation and culture fee assistance program. 
The program was developed to provide access to individuals in the community that might not be able to um, normally access recreation and cultural uh, and sport activities in the community. I guess you could use the analogy of, of trees and roots and, and the growth. Um, we're, we're hoping that the fee assistance program uh, has, has some roots now and that it continue to grow. Uh, and we'll be able to provide that access and those opportunities for people uh, long into the future. Um, you know, the same as these trees growing uh, and expanding, um, and hope, hopefully we can continue to provide that. Officials say beyond the fee assistance program, the other benefit was the planting of the trees which are now around the monument. I'm not sure that we would typically have this many trees available for a space this size. So through this program, we were able to beautify the space and create opportunity for greater biodiversity, uh, different variety of trees that always creates a healthier urban forest uh, environment and for generations to enjoy because they only continue to grow as they get older and the community matures. The monument is located just behind Senator Joyce Fairburn Middle School here in Lethbridge. A family-friendly, non-alcoholic event is taking place for those who want to learn more about and experience Indian culture. Around 400 people are expected to pack into the South Pavilion at Exhibition Park this weekend to celebrate the festival Navaratri. It's a Hindu festival that celebrates the triumph of good over evil. It is marked with cultural costumes, music, dancing and lots of food. In India, the festival spans nine nights and ten days. Vice President of the Gujarati Society of Lethbridge, Suketu Shah, explains what guests will experience. This is going to be a live event, so we will have a live group of singers. Six singers will, uh, six uh, group of six people will be performing here. So two singers and four musicians. And then when people come in, um, the major difference is the traditional dresses that you see me and Prana wearing right now. Something similar. 400 people will be here in the same kind of dress. At least 400. And then uh, we do, of course, we do have Indian food as well at the, in the middle of the event where they can buy the food depending on what they like. We would have a stall right here inside there as well. So they can expect a lot of people to see a lot of people dancing around here as well. And that's what the place here, it will be probably full with the crowd, at least 400 people dancing at the same time. Our dance is a collaboration dance. They just don't perform. Everybody can dance, including kids, seniors, adults and youth. The event runs until Sunday. You've heard the term a walk a mile in his shoes. Well now the Galt Museum and Archives is inviting people to view a new exhibit where they will walk a mile in an indigenous person's moccasins. It showcases 18 unique stories of Kanai and Pakani First Nation members. Kamina Weasel Moccasin, the curator of the exhibit, says the idea first began back in May. So then throughout the summers when I did majority of the engagements with people, um, and then after that, I actually, what I find really interesting about this exhibit, um, the first one done by the Indigenous curator here at the museum, it's all Blackfoot participants, and I was actually able to find a Blackfoot designer to design each of the, the squares. So for me, that was really important, that it was you know voices of the community coming from the community um, and very much kind of uh, community work to put it together. The plan is to have the exhibit up at the Galt Museum until the end of the year. There's the potential for it to become even bigger, featuring youth and the challenges they face today. RCMP are working with a First Nation in western Manitoba to investigate potential graves. The Pine Creek First Nation approached police after a private contractor detected ground anomalies beneath a church. Mounties say they have spoken with leadership from the First Nation who filed complaints about past abuses there. The investigation is to include multiple phases, with the first focused on speaking with witnesses, including elders and community members. The Saskatchewan government says more than 125 new full-time health care positions have been created in 49 rural and northern communities. More than 50 existing part-time positions have also been made full-time. The positions include registered nurses, psychiatric nurses and care aides. Health Minister Paul Merriman says it will lead to better workforce retention in remote and rural areas where it can be difficult to recruit. While we were above seasonal values for this time of year here in Lethbridge, and looking at the long-range forecast, the mercury will continue to climb. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. It was another stunning day here in Lethbridge, so nice not having to shovel any snow yet. Jeanette Roche is in now with a complete look at the weather picture. Jeanette, it doesn't appear as though any moisture will be in the forecast for quite some time. 
Yeah, you're right. That sky isn't going to snow anytime too soon. Mainly sunny for the rest of the weekend and into the week. Um, look at those temperatures too. We have a little bit of a, you know, kind of a lower temperature here on Saturday. 16 the high and then back up into the 20s. 23 the high for Sunday up to 24 on Monday. And look at that temperature for Tuesday. 25. Will we break a record that day? Well, possibly because back in 2003, uh, we saw the record, which was a 25.4 degrees. So we'll see if that's sticks around and if we can reach that on a Tuesday. Wednesday looking at a high of 23 and 24 to round out that seven day forecast on Thursday. Mainly sunny skies as well. Average high for this time of year 15. So we're still above average for the whole week. Average low one degree 27. That's where we were in 1961. That was the hottest on record. Coldest was minus seven back in 1966. 751 is when the sun rose this morning. Our sun set this evening at 644 p.m. giving us 10 hours and 50 three minutes of daylight four minutes shorter of a day than we had yesterday okay so west coast we're looking at mainly clear skies victoria's high 23 a bit cooler by the water 18 the high in vancouver lots of sunshine gonna feel more like 25 inland 14 degrees the high in edmonton tomorrow clear skies as well same thing for calgary up to 15 degrees the high there as we look to the rest of the prairies somewhat windy conditions in all three of these prairie cities looking at uh, 30 to 50k winds in saskatoon high of eight degrees nine degrees the high in Regina could see up to 60 K winds there eight degrees only in Winnipeg Winnipeg looking at a possibility of some showers maybe even some flurries looking at up to 60 K winds in Winnipeg as well Toronto's high 12 degrees looking at morning showers morning showers also expected in Ottawa 16 the high 17 the high in Montreal Montreal could see the chance of some showers appearing in the late afternoon in all three of those cities also looking at wind gusts up to 50 kilometers per hour on Atlantic, uh, in Atlantic Canada, rather, lots of rain expected in Fredericton. They're under a rainfall warning. Could see 30 to 40 millimeters tomorrow and a chance of a thunder shower. 18 the high there, 17 the high in Halifax tomorrow. Also expecting quite a bit of heavy rain, 20 degrees the high in Charlottetown. Could see a chance of rain there. Sunshine uh, in St. John's, Newfoundland tomorrow. 16 degrees the high there with fog dissipating in the morning. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Stats Canada says manufacturing sales in August were down for the fourth straight month. The federal agency says sales dropped 2% to $70.4 billion as petroleum and coal sales edged down on lower prices and volumes. Overall sales in constant dollars fell 1.7% in August in what is usually one of the busier times of the year. In a separate report, Stats Canada says wholesale sales in August rose 1.4% to reach a new high of $81.3 billion. The Canadian Real Estate Association says home sales last month were down just over 32% from a year earlier. Industry analysts say it's mainly due to higher mortgage rates. The group says sales were down 3.9% from August, which is usually a busy time of year. The number of newly listed homes declined by 1.5% from the same month last year. The national average home price was down 6.6% to just under $640,500. Korea says the market remains on the tighter side of balanced territory as many sellers are opting to hold out for much better conditions. Now is a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 287 points on the day to finish at 18,326. The Dow was down 403 points to 29,634. The S&P 500 was down 86 on the day to 3583. And the Nasdaq was down 327 points to 10,321. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 349 on the day to finish at 85.62 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 28 cents to 646 US. Gold was down 2203 to 1643.98 US an ounce. And silver was down 62 cents on the day to 1828 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.65 per bushel, barley's at $9.75, canola's at $19.61, and corn is at $12.45 per bushel. Live cattle were up 50 cents to $146.95, feeder cattle were down 95 cents to $173.80, and lean hogs were down 5 cents to $93.38. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $72.04 US.
Recapping one of our top stories, an inquiry into the Trudeau Liberals' use of the Emergencies Act heard first-hand testimony about the effect of the Freedom Convoy. Several witnesses gave their perspective on how the convoy affected their lives in downtown Ottawa. The protests saw semi-trucks honking their horns and blocking off certain areas of Ottawa over a three-week period. Similar demonstrations took part in other parts of the country, including at the Coots border crossing here in Alberta. Now, over the next six weeks, the hearings will see testimony from 65 witnesses, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Freedom Convoy organizer Tamara Leach. Watch Bridge City News for all of the details. So how damaging is the methane gas produced by cattle to our environment? Some believe that the emissions can be quite harmful, but others, including Alberta cattle rancher Ben Campbell, say it's all part of the natural cycle. Ben will have details for us shortly. Listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. The Lethbridge Handmade Market Spooktacular Edition is taking place Saturday, October 22nd at Exhibition Park in the South Pavilion from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Discover unique handmade treasures from over 100 artisans. Come in your favorite Halloween getup and take part in the costume contest. There's also a scavenger hunt and opportunities to win amazing door prizes. Admission is $5 per person and kids under 14 can enter for free. For details, visit Lethbridge handmademarket.ca Big Brothers, Big Sisters in Lethbridge is looking for volunteers to mentor children and youth in their various programs. Volunteers commit to one visit per week for one year. They have many kids that are looking for a big brother or sister. Make a difference in a child's life and start something big. To apply, visit lethbridge.bigbrothersbigsisters.ca and for more information, call 403-328-9355 And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. It's no secret that Alberta is a major agricultural source in Canada. Now, we always try to celebrate many of our farmers, including some of the younger ones. Each year, a young farmer becomes the recipient of the Alberta Northwest Territory Region of Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers Program. And this year's recipient is Ben Campbell, owner of a cattle ranch in Black Diamond. Uh, ben and his family are advocates of farming and ranching right here in Alberta. Ben, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks for having me. Now, first of all, congratulations on the big award. What does this honor really mean for you? Well, it's great because I'm a newcomer to agriculture, so I really had no expectation of, of winning the award. It was a huge surprise, and uh, it really shows, I think, how uh, welcoming the ag industry is to newcomers and, and how accessible it is for some people to get into. So, Ben, what made you decide to go into agriculture to begin with? Um, I actually had an engineering degree and a job as an engineer, uh, working in the oil sands, but it wasn't really my passion. I wanted to do something that I thought was good for the environment, something that gave back to my community, and something that was a better fit for me personally, like working outside and being my own boss. And a friend of mine told me about grazing cattle as a way to meet uh, kind of all those things that they could be good for the environment. I was actually a vegetarian in university, and uh, I didn't think that cattle were, were good for the environment. And I tried to limit my meat as much as I could. So um, totally changed all of that around. So how do you feel about some uh, government officials saying that cattle are not good for the environment because of all of the methane that comes out of them? What are your thoughts in that regard? Yeah, I mean, like blanket statements. The only blanket statement that's true is that blanket statements are not true, <laughs> which is, you know, their cattle can be great for the environment if they're managed properly and cattle can be bad for the environment if they're managed poorly. Um, methane that comes out of them is part of the natural carbon cycle. Methane is a carbon molecule. And so before there were cattle, there were bison, there's elk and uh, deer and all these different ruminants. And ruminants are a necessary keystone species on grasslands. So methane that's cycled is also absorbed. It has like a roughly a 10 year lifespan in the atmosphere. And so we have sort of a biological allowance for that. So I'm, I'm fine with that. It's, it fits in with a natural cycle. Can you give us a bit of an idea of why family farming is so important to Albertans? Oh, I don't know. It's hard to, <clears throat> hard to give one reason, but I mean, community is huge. I mean, it keeps rural communities alive. Employment, uh, agriculture is a huge business. I think it's really valuable to have owner operator um, farms where, you know, the person that owns the land and makes the business decisions also lives on the land and works on the land as opposed to, you know, um, 
a pension fund owning land and hiring a manager to, to run it. I think that really the, the owner operator system keeps people and the communities alive. Now you're located near Black Diamond here in Alberta. Do you feel that in your area there may be some different issues in raising cattle as compared to let's say regions around Lethbridge and Medicine Hat? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all facing the same sort of thing with heat and drought. I, uh, I mean, that's challenging us here too. Um, something that's probably unique to this area is how big we are to such a big city, although Lethbridge and Medicine Hat are big enough. But I mean, I'm competing when I look to buy or rent land. I'm competing against people who are stockbrokers or lawyers or dentists. So um, the land is not really priced on its agricultural value anymore. So how do you really compete with the bigger players? You have to use the value of the land. So part of the value of our land is that it's in close proximity to Calgary. Uh, so we, we sell direct market beef, uh, pork and eggs into the city of Calgary direct to consumers. So people can go on our website and buy something from us and then we deliver it into Calgary. So we're using sort of that value as being a local producer of food. Now, one of the criteria for this award is uh, making the most of your income from on-farm sources. With all we're hearing about inflation costs, has this on-farm income become more of a challenge for you? Oh, on-farm income is very uh, variable. It changes so much from year to year. This year has been a really good year for um, cattle prices. They've gone up. Grain prices are way up. So a lot of farmers actually did really well the last you know, two years. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends on a lot of the different constraints that we have. But the last two years financially have been pretty good. Now, Ben, how about inflation? How much has it really impacted your business? I mean, we sell, uh, because we sell an end product to consumers, our product costs more because of inflation now. Uh, because we set our own prices, we have a bit of a safety net. So when our costs go up, we increase our prices uh, proportionally. So um, it hasn't affected sales yet, because uh, you can only increase the price so much to cover your costs before you start impacting sales. But so far, we're, we're doing okay. We sell out... Um, quite often, and we haven't raised our prices in about five years. So, so far, I would say inflation hasn't been a huge concern for us. How about the carbon tax? Has it much impact on your business? No, we have no, no impact from the carbon tax, really. Uh, farm fuel, like gasoline and diesel, is exempt from the carbon tax. Uh, and we're pretty um, input. We try to limit our inputs. We uh, try to be a nature-based, low overhead business, so we don't have a lot of uh, costs from, from stuff like that. We're putting, there's a solar grant out and a solar loan, so you can get a loan to cover the cost of solar panels. And then there's a grant that I think it covers like a quarter of the cost. So we're actually installing solar panels on the farm this month to make our farm completely uh, net zero for electricity. So Ben, before you decided to get into the agriculture business, did you do some research to see about how farming and ranching has maybe changed over the years and how it can be profitable for you and your family? Yeah, I mean, I, I came into agriculture knowing literally nothing. The first book that I bought was uh, Raising Beef Cattle for Dummies, those black and yellow dummies <laughs> books. So, I mean, I literally knew nothing. I knew nobody uh, in agriculture. Um, I started, I got the Canadian Angus um, Breeders Association directory online and started cold calling people and asking if they would be willing to give me advice. So yeah, I've spent a lot of time learning and I uh, went through a formal mentorship program called the Cattlemen Young Leaders Program uh, and uh, got a mentor through that program to learn about how to direct market beef and how to raise beef cattle and how to use stock dogs and low stress livestock handling. And I've spent a huge amount of time and money uh, on learning. I have a friend of mine out by Pinoka who raises a lot of Black Angus and he said they're very popular. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, Black Angus are very popular. That's probably one of the most popular breeds. There's, uh, for our, our direct marketing, we, we try to use smaller frame cattle, so we're often using Angus and Hereford cattle. What, the, what other breeds are we talking about? Outside of, I guess, maybe some of the dairy cows. Uh, Simmental, Charley, uh, are probably two of the biggest uh, others outside of um, Angus and Hereford. Now you have to explain this to me, the city slicker here. How do you protect a lot of the cattle, you know, when it's bitterly cold outside, minus 30, minus 40 degrees, and if you don't have a barn big enough to house, you know, maybe five or 10,000 head? Yeah, so there's no, uh, no need to bring cattle in indoors in the winter, like not beef cattle. Um, Chickadees and, and wild bison and deer and all sorts of animals spend the whole year outside, uh, including winter. And so if you manage your cattle properly, 
they need to have a, a proper fat cover. They need to go into winter in good physical condition and they need to have protection from um, wind. So we put up wind breaks or have natural wind breaks like trees. And then they need to have good access to, to water, drinking water and a full belly of food. They're the rumination uh, process or the rumen, the fermentation process in the rumen is a heat generating process. So if they've got a full belly, they've got a furnace in their stomachs keeping them warm. So how old is the average cow before it's taken to market? Uh, in the co commercial industry, the um, average cattle are between the ages of 15 and 18 months old, typically when they're uh, brought to slaughter. And then in the grass fed direct market, they're about double that, about 30 months old. Now in the past, you've said that cattle serve the needs of the grass and soil and not the other way around. Can you re really explain how grazing cattle is a benefit to the grass and soil? Yeah, so <clears throat> ecosystems function as a system and they need to have all of their parts or else they don't work. So it's the same way as, you know, a car won't work without a transmission or without an engine or without a fuel tank. Ecosystems need all of their parts in order to function properly. And um, when the glaciers came by, they scraped off all the topsoil uh, in this area of North America and bison and herds of large ruminants rebuilt that topsoil. So the grasses evolved with specifically with grazers and they have a symbiotic relationship where the cattle need the grass and the grass needs the cattle. There's different types of grasses and with different types of growing competitive strategies. And the act of grazing changes the structure of the, of the canopy of grass and allows different species to flourish. So you actually get a lot of biodiversity as well. You know, I read years ago that pasture land can actually withstand forest fires. Is that true? Yeah, uh, grasses, most of their roots are underground. Most of their system is underground, and so they're they're able to withstand uh, flooding <clears throat> and drought um, and uh, fires quite well, and they can bounce back really well. Expect, so the big thing that we try to do is have healthy grass and healthy soil, so that when you get a big deluge of rain, you're able to absorb that rain and have very little runoff. And when you get a something, if you had a fire, you would have big energy reserves underground, so the grass can bounce back and grow really quickly. Now, Ben, many cattle ranchers say that cattle are nutrient recyclers. Would you agree with that? And if so, why? Yeah, so cattle, they do a great thing. Um, they eat foods that humans can't eat, so specifically grasses. If you have a pasture or a hill or a forest, um, you can put cattle in there. They'll eat those grasses that are completely inedible to humans and form uh, human edible calories. So without destroying or damaging, but in fact benefiting that environment, cattle are able to produce food while making that environment better. And also we have crops that are grown like wheat and barley. And those ones, if they're used for human consumption, that's great. And sometimes you'll get situations, uh, frost or hail, or it's too wet to harvest. There's different things that can decrease the quality of those foods down to what we're called feed quality, where they're not human edible consumption. And so those can be used with cattle, rather, rather than let them go to waste, you can feed them to cattle and they'll recycle those nutrients and convert them again back into human edible uh, calories. Now, can you share with our viewers how grazing protects land areas against invasive species of plants? Yeah, so different plants have different co um, competitive strategies. So exa for example, some grow really well in hot weather, some grow really well in cold, some grow really well in dry, and some grow really well in wet. And what cattle do when they graze is they'll level off. So if there's, for example, early growing plants, if you just didn't put cattle in there, the early growing, tall growing plants would take over the field and you would end up with them out competing everything else. And you'd have a monoculture, which meaning just one species of plants growing in that field. And when you get cattle in, they'll graze off the early ones, the early growing plants, which is fine. And then you get some later growing plants and then cattle will graze those later growing plants off. And then next year you've got the early growing plants coming back in. So you're, you're having a cycle of different types of things growing together. Now you talked earlier about uh, selling your meat directly to consumers here, Ben. Can you share with us the benefits of grazing grass fed cattle over cattle from a feedlot? I wouldn't really want to compare like saying one's better than the other, but there's differences. So the grass fed cattle, they take longer to produce. It's slower. Um, some people say that it's more flavorful. Uh, it's a little bit more, it can be more expensive to produce. Um, they're raised in a nature-based system. So if that's something that you're interested in, you know, they're, they're grazed kind of year round. They're not brought into, into a confined feeding situation. So there's, it's just a kind of a personal preference on what people would like. 
Now, we often hear advertising and the difference between Canadian versus American beef products. Can you share with us the big difference between the same product, but from two different nations? Uh, the saying sort of goes, the farther north you go, the higher quality the beef is. <clears throat> um, we grow a lot better crops here. Like we're able to grow alfalfa better because we have cool nights. They just don't get those kind of cool nights in the United States. Um, so we grow really high quality alfalfa. And of course, a lot of other things where uh, the cattle don't have to worry about overheating. So they're able to become really fat without be, being in trouble of overheating. Uh, so I think those are probably the two big factors that allow us to, um, to grow the ideal, the best, the best beef in the world is, is having cattle that are able to finish at AAA or prime quality uh, with uh, grasses that were grown locally. Now, Ben, is there anything else you want to chat with us about in regards to raising cattle to be successful? Yeah, I would say that the best, the most important thing to do is to try if you want to be a producer. As someone who's new to the industry, um, you know, it's important for people to know that you don't have to be born uh, into an inheritance in order to have a, uh, a ranch or in order to be in agriculture. You just need to get your foot in the door and try really hard and be willing to fail and be willing to take risks. And uh, I'd say that to consumers, you know, uh, the regular people, it's your product in the end. Um, you're the ones that are buying it. You're the ones that are eating it. And so it's your say on how it's produced and it's your say in what you want. And so your, your dollar is your vote and you, you buy what you, what you want us to produce. And, and we're a team uh, sort of in that together. Ben Campbell is the recipient of the Alberta Northwest Territory Region of Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers Program. Ben, thanks a lot for joining us today from Black Diamond, Alberta. Thanks for having me. Medicine Hat is one of the sunniest spots in Canada. The Gas City is a popular destination for families with young children and retirees alike. Business and community in the southeast part of our province is strong and growing. And to talk more about the potential of Medicine Hat, here is Lisa Kowalchuk, the Executive Director of the Medicine Hat Chamber of Commerce. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Michael. Yeah, we're happy to have you here. Now, as we have a few months left in 2022, what are some of the wins for businesses in the hat this year? I think so many of our communities can probably say the same, just in terms of the resiliency of our businesses and making it through kind of the global pandemic and the different innovations that we saw with our businesses um, from different workforce strategies to, you know, so many of our businesses, particularly our restaurants, putting out patios so that they could uh, serve their businesses and seeing those continue beyond and, and being able to create spaces and experiences for, for their patrons and for our community. I think, you know, another win and success within our community is despite some of the challenges, we still saw a number of business start up. Um, and during a very difficult time, taking that risk and that challenge and, you know, surviving through and, and becoming very successful. So it's, it's really neat to see, again, the strength and resiliency of our business community and those connections and, and the deeper connections, I think, that have been formed and, and continue to, to grow within our community. So it's a really strong presence of our entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurial mindset that we have in particular, I think across Alberta and we see it in Southern Alberta in particular, um, the willingness to take risks and certainly even those that have expanded their businesses. Yes, yeah, it is great to see, especially the collaboration between businesses. I know my friend Ryan, who's a carpenter in Medicine Hat, he built the uh, outdoor staging as it were for the Mad Hatter. And of course the locals always a great spot to spend the summer outside uh, while visiting with friends. So that is great to see. How about some of the challenges for 2022? Yeah, I think, again, this is probably, you know, reflected in, in a lot of communities, but it has been increasingly difficult for business because of that accelerating pace of change and, and constant change that they're having to adapt to. You know, you, you put in a global pandemic and the economic, fiscal, regulatory environment that they're having to deal with. You know, even in terms of the technological shift. So obviously that was accelerated in the last two years out of necessity. But, you know, a decade ago, smartphones really didn't exist. Three decades ago, no one really owned a computer when you look back in time um, in terms of households. And 
we have demographic changes that are impacting us, workforce and workplace trends that are becoming redefined with automation and remote work and new forms of work in the gig economy. Um, technology obviously is accelerating at an exponential pace and there's more cybersecurity needed and more challenges and big data and AI and blockchain. So, you know, you look at all of those things and I always say, you know, we're very fortunate that we have different skills, expertise and resources as a chamber that we can tap into. But, you know, businesses really need to be connected, resilient and resourceful because there are so many different things that that are impacting their business and, and constant changes in political trends and uh, just the global economy overall. So I think the only thing certain is change. And uh, as a chamber, we know we need to be responsive and willing to be able to assist our businesses, recognize and adapt to that evolving landscape, um, and certainly still recognizing the challenges of our business that they're just trying to run their day-to-day -day operations. And so trying to keep up with all of that is, is very difficult. And I think out of all of that, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen, and I think we see it across the board, is certainly the labor force and workforce and uh, the demand for labor. So that is something we've we've really honed in on. Now, how about the provincial government? Uh, this year, has have they taken maybe more of an active role in helping local businesses recover from the pandemic? Yeah, I think there certainly we've seen it across the board in terms of the different incentives uh, that have been provided and and different opportunities. So things like the Jobs Now program or, you know. Uh, the Canada Alberta Summer Job Program, in addition to some of the federal um, response on a local level, we had a number of uh, incentives that had been introduced as well on a local level, which we didn't see in a lot of other municipalities. And some of those incentives are ongoing or, or continuing to evolve because we also recognize that you know, despite what has happened in the last couple of years, we have economic recovery ahead of us. And so how do we you know, continue to to recognize the challenges of the businesses, but ensure that we're continuing to evolve, adapt, innovate to um, to recover and and grow and thrive as we move forward. Right now, um, how about the city council um, and the new mayor? Like I was thinking of Jim Turner as you were the late Jim Turner as you were chatting, and he was such a delightful fellow. Uh, City Council is a little bit different. We have a new mayor in Medicine Hat. Can you talk about the relationship or maybe what they've done for the community or the business community, I should say? Yeah, I think we've always had a really good relationship with our city councils and have always have had that open dialogue, which uh, certainly we see benefit because, you know, they they joke every once in a while that we're the official opposition. But really, we say we're just we're just there to, to help improve the environment and just uh, make note or make point of the things that we can just do a little bit better. And certainly with a change in council comes that. Um, you know, that establishment of, of a new era and communication and looking at how we can align strategic plans and priorities moving forward. The City Council recently adopted a new uh, strategic plan. And so within that, we've certainly taken a look and made some points of the areas that we can really um, hone in on, look to... Uh, kind of capitalize on. So in terms of innovation, there is a willingness to pursue opportunities and remove obstacles to success and innovation and looking at development. There is a desire. The second strategy is the economic evolution. So we always like to see when the economy is a priority and looking at how we encourage a strong and diversified regional economy, um, as well as encour encouraging entrepreneurship. There is a goal for service orientation. So as we all know, we need our municipalities to be easy to deal with from a business uh, perspective. Um, they are looking at partnerships and governance, and we hope to play a fairly prominent role in those partnerships in terms of how we can uh, ensure that there is resources for our business community and those connections and that we're able to provide insight into, into ways that we can adapt and grow community wellness, resilience and sustainability. So we have had conversations with council. We actually have a meeting coming up here um, with our council at the end of the month and we continually 
um, seek out those opportunities where we can kind of um, reflect and, and communicate and ensure that we're constantly moving forward. So we did a presentation to city council. This is a follow-up to that. And we regularly have those meetings to uh, discuss how we move plans forward. So not just talk for the sake of talk, but actually see those action plans. Right, and that's great. That is um, one of the things that I've always liked about the Medicine Hat Chamber of Commerce and the Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce as well, is how active a role the Chamber takes in advocating for business and business ideas. Um, one of the things that I, I like that the Medicine Hat Chamber does is the Brown Bag Series. Can you talk a little bit about how those new businesses, or maybe they're entrenched businesses, but they, they kind of need a new strategy or something. Can you talk a little bit about the, the Brown Bag Series? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because that was a new initiative that we did start in 2022 and has been going really well. And it was, again, out of a recognized need that businesses don't necessarily have all the tools in their toolkit to, to succeed and to thrive and to grow. And so we wanted to launch the series as a way to give them some of those additional resources and to provide a bit of training from professionals within our community. So that business to business connection. So if they have questions, they don't have to call somebody outside of, outside of our community for that professional advice. These are professionals right within our community that are here to, to support the businesses. And so it's really walking them through. I always say businesses know their trade. They're really good at what they do, which is typically why they start a business, because they're passionate about that particular industry or trade or, or skill set that they have. But they ne haven't necessarily be get, been given the skills to run a business. So you have to deal often with HR and finance and cash flow and dealing with you know, the different regulatory environments and cybersecurity and, and websites and communication and social media and all of that. And it gets really overwhelming. Um, so what we really try to do is break that down, simplify it into topical uh, sessions that businesses can attend at no charge. That's great. Now, I know... Medicine Hat has a lot of opportunity, I think, for new and established businesses. Certainly the weather is great, um, but can you talk a little bit about how the Chamber and Invest Medicine Hat uh, and even like um, uh, Tracy Stroud and Apex work together to uh, help businesses? Yeah, I think a really good example is actually the Connector platform. So if you go to the Apex Alberta website, there's actually an online platform that it's so again an evolution through through this global pandemic where you can enter a virtual um, building and go into different rooms and and see some of the different supports. So it is a collaborative environment where all of those business supports are represented, uh, not only in Medicine Hat but in the region. And so it's this online platform. So it's intended even for businesses. So perhaps they don't have the time or they can't connect during business hours or they're you know they're looking at Medicine Hat as a place to come or to invest. They have this 24 hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week service that they can go in um, and find some of those resources. So that's a good example of, of the collaboration. The, another one that had been done by all, all the parties, all the business support providers within our region was the Invest Southeast Alberta Initiative. And so that really kicked off in about 2019 and it was to look at business retention expansion and workforce development and of course we had this lovely little uh, global situation occur in a couple of years and so there has still been a lot of work done as a result of that another one of the initiatives that came out of that whole collaboration was the move to medicine hat website so with tourism medicine hat and community futures entrecore they have developed a beautiful website that talks about you know if you want to come to live, work, or play in Medicine Hat and the resources. And then you couple that with resources that we've built on our website. So we have a whole business resource page, but we also developed a business support toolkit that has all of the resources from the different partners included and who you can connect with for business supports. That's great. Now, we talked a little bit earlier, uh, just briefly about kind of a labor shortage. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe the the new building permits and house sales how have they been this year in medicine hat 
Yeah, so when I was looking at the stats, um, certainly the building permit values have increased the annual change when I looked at statistically by 53, just about 54%. And then in terms of the number of permits, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, flat in terms of where we've been at. Um, and then in terms of the stats on, on house sales, I actually had reached out to the uh, Medicine Hat Real Estate Board, and they would be a phenomenal resource uh, to connect specifically on that. But um, certainly for housing starts, you know, again, we haven't seen huge growth, but still relatively stable, which is always good to see. We certainly don't want to see the declines. We want to see it growing. And I think, too, when you look at what has occurred in the last couple of years, that certainly makes sense too. But the housing market just anecdotally is still really strong. Houses are not staying on the market all that long. That's great. I was chatting last night with one of my high school friends who uh, is a real estate sales member. And he was actually telling me that his office gets a lot of calls from Canadians in Manitoba and Ontario about moving to Medicine Hat. Uh, can you share with us a few things that attracts those young families to the area? Well, I think it's, you know, the quality of life. When you look at the, the pace of life and the cost of living, I mean, it certainly has been top of mind in terms of affordability across our country. Um, and so I think more and more people are looking at just the cost of living and affordability and Medicine Hat provides that in terms of the housing market, residential tax rates, you know, um, an accessible, walkable community. So I think that's very attractive to a lot of people and they're looking to escape kind of the busyness of the larger centers and looking to, you know, mid-sized centers like ours where you still have all of the amenities and you still have opportunities. Um, but you, you know, it's not quite this, it's not an hour commute to work. You can get anywhere in the city in, you know, 15 minutes. Um, and so I think that's very attractive. It's a safe community. So, you know, when people are looking at raising a young family, it's certainly a place you want to go, certainly a place that, uh, I've invested in personally and, and why I call Medicine Hat home. Yeah. There's so many great neighborhoods too in Medicine Hat, um, and I have like probably another 27 questions I could ask you, but we're out of time, unfortunately. So um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. It was great to hear about Medicine Hat and all the potential for the future. Well, and if people want to know more, they can come onto our website, medicinehatchamber.com or give us a call. We'd we always love talking about Medicine Hat. So, and, and the Southern Alberta region. I think we have a great region here within the province. So thank you very much for watching. For all of us here at Bird City News, I'm Michael Claussen. God bless and have a great night.